Uh, how you doing on a scale of one to ten? Go ahead and shout it out. Ready? One, two, three. So on average, about seven uh, is, what I, is what I picked up there. Excellent. Uh, anybody a ten? All right, stand up and pump your fists. Anybody a two? You get a hug. Just hug the twos next to you. Jesus is coming soon. Seasons, right? Like Ben was saying, seasons. We got some warm-up questions, though, uh, to get, uh, get the faith flowing, get, get the blood uh, flowing. Uh, so, many, so many we could choose from today. Uh, what's my job? It's my job. Me, Jordan. Uh, what's, what's my job? What's, what's like the main thing I, I, I do around this place? <laughs> <clears throat> sorry, sorry, sorry. Pastoral care. Pastoral care, meaning? Oh, I care for people. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting theory. Yeah, that's great. What, 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 what any, any other uh, suggestions? Trying to teach you correct things. In his, I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher. How many would say teacher? Teacher. All right. All right. What else? What, what, what might I do around here? I, so, somebody shouted something out, but it was inarticulate. Empower others to do, to do what? To, to empower others to do their purpose. That's a good blue water answer. It's Elton Wong, ladies and gentlemen. There he is, the man, still eligible, ladies. It's fantastic. All right, one or two more answers. What's, what's my job around here? Yeah, Dave. Leader, leader, as in like you guys follow. Interesting theory, interesting. All sorts of interesting things coming out here. Yeah, Lori. Coach, coach, that's interesting. What sort of things do I coach you to do ostensibly? How to, how to go about doing kingdom things ostensibly. Fantastic, yeah. Um, I'm a coach. I, I, this morning, I got up at 4 a.m. and I ran a marathon relay uh, with the distance running kids that I coach. Uh, sometimes it sucks to be a coach, um, but we all survived it. Um, but kingdom things, coach you to do kingdom things, that's better. All right, how many of you think that my chief job here at Blue Water Mission is to be a miracle worker? F four, maybe five of you. How many think that my chief job, my chief job is to do supernatural things? My, that's, my, that's my biggie. Now we're up to like, like eight. All right. Just, I, I don't know what I get paid for. It's just, I'm just taking a survey. It has nothing to do with the sermon. It's just, <laughs> it's just interesting. I got to report to the board, you know. Um, all right. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, uh, different warm-up question. For you veterans, for you re veterans, so people who have, say, been following Jesus for like over a year, veterans, what would you do to be sure that your protégés, the ones that you are helping along, uh, the disciples coming up uh, behind you, what would you, be, what would you do to be sure uh, that your protégés, your disciples, are prepared for passing on the kingdom? What, what, what do you want to pass on to them to make sure that they can go on and be ministers and disciplers in their own right? Think about it. All right. The ability to seek. It's a good blue water answer. He's taken, ladies, but that's fantastic. Yeah, you know, the... the uh, the capacity and the discipline to be a seeker in life. Excellent answer. Get involved. Get involved. Yeah, because showing up is 80% of anything, right? You got to participate. We are not a, a sit on your okole uh, kind of community. Uh, you become a member by participating in things. Fantastic answer. That's good. You guys are smart. What else? What would you pass on? Humility, character trait. Lewis had one. Teach them how to hear and obey God because, yeah, I mean, we're all really following God. Uh, 
ultimately, and it's a relationship, and the bedrock of any relationship is conversation, right? So the ability to hear God for yourself. Excellent answer. Excellent answer. Others? Courage to walk by faith. Courage. Yeah, it's one of those synonyms for faith. Uh, and and to, uh, to try things, to, to risk things, and all excellent answers. Just, just curious, how many of you would say that one, if not the primary thing that you need to pass on to, to those you're trying to influence is supernatural experience, miraculous experience. How many of you would say that? The same four people who think that my chief job is to be a miracle worker. Um, let's say, let's just say, this is quiz day, and you're all getting extra credit. Let's just say uh, that when we gather together in large meetings like this at Blue Water Mission, um, maybe as well when we gather together in our Ohana groups, in small groups that we, we gather in in people's homes and offices and stuff like that. Let's say that when we gather together, one of the chief things we were supposed to do was miracles. When we gather together, one of, like right at the top of our to-do list would be supernatural things. Let's just say that's true. What do you need to do to help make it happen? Help create the environment, uh, which is a good diagnostic. Now, how would you help create the environment to do miracles today, let's say? Have faith. Have faith. Bring faith. Make space for it. It's a great answer. Do 24-hour prayer. Stay up all night, pray, uh, and then show up at church which is what the prayer team just did uh, before coming today. Excellent. What sort of, uh, I mean, faith is primarily an attitude, right? Uh, what sort of attitude would you come to church with? It's like, it's like we had to pull off miracles today. What attitude would you come with? Expectant. Other words? Desperate. Yeah, depending on if you define that, I think that's great. Consistency, showing up, showing up, bring the attitude. Yeah. Eagerness. Yeah. Uh, did you come with that attitude uh, today? Did you run into the gym uh, with eagerness and expectancy and consistency? Yes? No? Turn to your neighbor and make the appropriate confession. I'll give you eight seconds. Go. It's bonding. This is bonding, people. This is bonding. Yeah, if you're new to Blue Water Mission, uh, it's awkward, but everybody is awkward together, so somehow it helps. Uh, when people ask me how Blue Water Mission uh, got started, I often tell the story of the first Holy Spirit retreat that I did here on the island. How many of you have been to a Blue Water Holy Spirit retreat? The sort of thing that we do to introduce people to the presence and the power of God in the here and now, uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit. And what I did is I gathered together around 15 young adults who had never really had any supernatural experience with the presence of God. And we went out to, uh, to the North Shore uh, for a weekend, and, and the first 36 hours, we just went through all the passages of Scripture that have to do with the presence of the Spirit sort of coming and filling people, uh, what Jesus and the early apostles and John the Baptist referred to as the filling of the Holy Spirit or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We study that. And then what I was going to do is to pray for this, this uh, crowd of folks to, to be filled with the presence of God with supernatural power. And so I took them out to the beach and and we got in this circle, and I stood in the middle, and I just prayed for the presence of the Holy Spirit to come. And some of them looked at me like I was nuts, and, and at least one of them was legitimately angry, I remember, with their arms folded, glaring at me. Uh, and, uh, and other people were just, you know, hungry for the presence of God. Uh, and then I just sort of, you know, felt like, you know, the presence of the Lord show up. And, and the first one uh, the Lord really fell on was the, the girl who was angry with her arm folded, glaring at me because she did not believe in supernatural stuff. And, of course, you know, the Holy Spirit fills her and she starts shaking and she starts crying as the Lord softens her heart. And then 
after I just sort of prayed for her a few moments, she just burst out speaking in tongues. Have you heard of that? It's when the Lord enables you to speak in a language that you don't actually understand. Uh, uh, Paul says, though I speak with the tongues of angels and men and have not love. In other words, sometimes, you know, it's an angelic language that nobody understands. Sometimes it's a foreign language that somebody around you might understand, even though you yourself don't understand it. I've heard speak people get miraculously and instantaneously get tongues in Spanish, which I can understand. French, Hebrew, I understand snippets of Hebrew or, uh, or foreign tongues like Bangla and, and things that were appropriate to the environment. Suddenly, somebody who can't speak the language is fluent in the language of the people around them. I've seen that on occasion. Uh, really cool. The Spirit fell on other people. Some of them were sort of electrified. They fell down unconsciously. One guy named Kevin who was wearing designer jeans and just took a face plant in the sand. It was awesome. Uh, um, and uh, I would say uh, yeah, the, the young adults that were on that retreat have themselves gone off to lead. I, I forget how many dozens of Holy Spirit retreats now in at least six other countries and across the U.S. So it was a really influential experience is what I'm saying. And all it was was the presence of the Holy Spirit coming upon a small group of people and to sort of change them. It empowered them. It was me sort of passing on to them something that had been passed on to me. And the something was nothing fancier and just the powerful, immediate presence of God. That's what it was. And in my humble opinion, I think that's the most important thing for me to pass on because it's the bedrock of everything else. You know, if the Holy Spirit is with you, if you are interacting powerfully with the supernatural presence of God, well, it's faith building. It certainly makes it easier for you to converse with the Lord supernaturally. Um, it's certainly emboldening. Um, once you get that conversation and experience started with the presence of God, well, you can seek other things. I mean, you can question Him. You can learn quickly because you're walking with God instead of studying God from afar. It makes all the difference in the world. Sometimes it can look kind of weird. Sometimes it involves speaking languages that you don't understand. Sometimes it's just a stirring of the heart that makes you cry and makes you be emotional. But it changes things. And Jesus had a lot to say about that uh, experience, uh, as it turns out. Uh, we are um, doing this short post-Easter sermon series on the 40 days uh, after Jesus was resurrected. He didn't just get resurrected and then ascend to heaven. He got resurrected. And then, you know, somewhere around six weeks, he actually hung out on earth for a while. He hung out uh, with those who had followed him uh, previous to his crucifixion and resurrection. Uh, church history has it that he also visited some people who had not believed in him previously, and some of them came to faith. Uh, Jesus is... Um, half-brother James, probably being the most prominent one. And, and you know, and just put your, put your mind there with these guys. They've just seen their Lord killed. And then he came back to life. And, and that raises some issues, doesn't it? I mean, they, they, don't, they don't have hundreds of years of, of uh, history uh, behind them to understand what's going on. It's a very destabilizing experience uh, in a lot of ways. Obviously, some emerging issues like, what just happened? What, what was that that just happened? That was a big one. Why did that happen? And then, of course, what is going to happen next? All really important questions that these guys were struggling with, and Jesus was, was trying to pastor them through that, coach them through that, teach them through that. And we've gone through some of the interactions that Jesus had with people post-resurrection, pre-ascension to heaven. And he has talked to them about significant things. He talked to them uh, largely about the rewards of faith and the function of faith. Faith is a really big deal. He talked to them about excuses to believe and excuses to not believe and how, you know, we're always going to live there in that tension and we need to make choices of faith, as somebody was mentioning earlier. Uh, he talked about, well, he didn't so much talk about, but he communicated about recovery from failure this beautiful interaction with the Apostle Peter who had abandoned him on uh, the, uh, the eve of his death, and, 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 and Jesus restores him. 
uh, to power and, and, and propriety. And he talked uh, several times about what you might call the ministry of forgiveness, how the point of using kingdom power is to actually just dispense forgiveness to people, sometimes whether they ask it or not. Whomever you forgive is forgiven, Jesus says. Just get out there and, and do it. And obviously, one thing that he wants to do is to prep his followers for what is to come, for what is next, the campaign to, you know, change the world, which we know, sitting here, they actually pulled off. They did change the world. But he's sort of prepping them for that. He's talking to them about being witnesses around the earth. And, and, and we get one of those interactions. I've excerpted two, one from Luke and one from Acts, two passages uh, from two different books written by the same author, as it turned out. Uh, Luke, the physician, a follower of the Apostle Paul, wrote both of them. And they're kind of two takes on the same little interaction that Jesus had with the guys, or at least the same sort of interactions. Uh, from Luke 24, Jesus is hanging out with the guys right before He's going to ascend to heaven. And He said to them, uh, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the Scriptures. That's a nice gift. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. You should have seen that coming. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. There's that ministry of forgiveness again. He's always hitting that. Beginning at Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. That's your job. You're witnesses. You're testifiers. I am going to send you what my Father promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. One of my favorite phrases, just so rich. And when he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven, which is to say these are his last words. This is his finale. It's like the one thing he wants to say before he takes off. And the last thing he says is, you're going to get a gift of power. You're going to be clothed with power from on high. See you. And that was 2,000 years ago. Um, nice, nice little passage. You know, Jesus hits on, you know, scriptural understanding of who the Messiah is. That's good readiness. Wants to make sure that his guys understand scripture before he takes off. He talks about the necessity and nature of Christ's sacrifice and resurrection, sort of the bedrock of Christian theology. He wants to make sure they understand that before he takes off. He pounds this forgiveness ministry thing. It's like, we're going to preach, and what, one thing we're really going to preach is forgiveness in Jesus' name. Um, that's really uh, primary. He defines their mission quickly. He says, you're going to be my witnesses all over the place. We're going to start in Jerusalem, but then this thing is going to go global. It's going to go viral. He didn't say that, but if the word existed, then they would have said it. Uh, and then he speaks of the final bit. He says, stay in the city. Don't try this stuff until you've been supernaturalized. Don't try this until you've been clothed with power from on high. That's a necessary ingredient. You got it? All right, ready, break. And then he was, he was off. Um, clothed with power from on high. Such a rich phrase. I love it. In, in Scripture, clothing is often symbolic of readiness. Jesus tells this uh, parable about people who are going to uh, a wedding banquet, a huge party, a huge festival, and they can't get in because they have the wrong clothes. He said, be ready. Be ready for the purposes of Christ whenever they come. Be ready for the kingdom of God. Whenever it shows up in your life, you got to be ready. And here he's talking about clothed with power. If you want to be ready to change the world, if you want to be ready to follow your purpose, get your power clothes on. Get your power clothed on. And I can pretty much guarantee you that these guys had no idea what he was talking about. Clothed with power from on high. What the heck does that mean? Oh, there he goes. 
didn't really have a chance to flesh it out too much. But it was the sort of phrase that would stick with them. And then, you know, they had to just wait. What they did actually is they went to a prayer meeting for about 10 days. They prayed. Um, we'll get to that story in a minute. As I mentioned, Luke writes two books, and he starts his second book, the book of Acts, as he ends his first book with the same sort of uh, vignette between Jesus and the guys right before uh, Jesus took off, takes off. And that passage uh, is in the program as well from Acts uh, chapter 1. So this is ver the very beginning of the book. It's, it's nominally called the Acts of the Apostles. A proper title should probably be something like the Acts of the Holy Spirit that the apostles were always trying to catch up to. Um, but this is how it starts. In my former book, Theophilus, Theophilus means uh, lover of God. So, in my former book, Lover of God, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke spoke about the kingdom of God. Well, this is the interim 40-day period that we've been studying the last several weeks in the sermon series. And Luke sort of starts the book of Acts with a summary of that. It was a very significant time for a lot of them, obviously. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, wait in the city, but wait for the gift my father promised. Same thing which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So a different potent phrase. Instead of saying clothed with power from on high, uh, Luke picks a different part of the conversation to emphasize here. And Jesus described it as being baptized, or the Greek word literally means doused or soaked with the Holy Spirit. You're going to be doused with the Holy Spirit. Uh, in, in a few days. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Are you going to be that, you know, political military Messiah that we thought you were at the beginning? Uh, we know the answer to that. But Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but, you know, you know forget that. Let's get back to the point. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. This is the main thing, guys. Don't be worried about all that other stuff. Let's get back to the clothed with power from on high. Let's get back to the baptized in the Holy Spirit bit. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You got it? The power thing. The Holy Spirit thing. You got it? After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. Again, like his last words, right? His last words. Remember this. <clears throat> um, and I, 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 I have a feeling that still they didn't know exactly what to expect, but they knew they were supposed to be waiting for some sort of important move of, of their Holy Spirit. Here he talks about uh, the Spirit coming upon them and filling them with power to do their job, with power to be witnesses around the world. That's a super important prep. That's a super important thing to pass on to somebody, you know. No wonder it was his finale, his parting words. And thus ends the 40 days. That's it. That's the end of this period that we have been studying. That's how it ends. Um, those of you who have been going to the newcomers class, which I believe ends today, we'll do another one soon, um, have learned that Blue Water has uh, four distinctives. We kind of make a big deal about them because we feel like it, it, it keeps us honest. It's hard to sort of walk the kingdom path in the world, so, you know, we try to create bullet points for ourselves or compass points, things that sort of help us stay on track as a fellowship. Uh, the, the, the first distinctive we have as a church 
uh, is, is grace, or sometimes we call it anti-religiosity. We talk a lot about grace here. It's the hardest thing for people to understand. Believers or, or non-believers all struggle with grace, you know, um, and uh, we try to major on it because it's at the heart of the kingdom. Uh, we talk about being anti-materialistic or radically generous. That's part of the reason that we take a quarter of all the money that comes into the church and we just give it uh, straight to the poor. Um, Jesus talked about money and wealth more than he talked about any single moral issue by a factor of at least four. Um, so, huge deal. If, if you want to be free from the world, you have to be free from money. You can be rich, you can poor, doesn't be poor, it doesn't matter, but you got to be free. You got to be free. So, we really try to discipline ourselves uh, in that way. Uh, Another one is mission orientation. Life is ministry. The main thing that you got to do is to follow your purpose in Christ. In your purpose lies your power, and everything else should flow from there. As Jesus said, seek first the kingdom, and then everything else can be added to you. And the remaining one is what we call supernaturalism. We make space for God to be supernatural as a point of discipline. Otherwise, the naturalness, the materialism of the world overwhelms us. That's why we end every service with the ministry team over there trying to heal people, trying to prophesy to people, stuff like that. If you stop expecting God to be supernatural, then you lose something super important in your life with Jesus. Plus, you can't pass it on to the next person. And Jesus said, don't try anything unless you have that supernatural experience with God. You will be less powerful as a result. Um, that, was, that was his point. Uh, we uh, don't want to be a community of experts, uh, though hopefully we have wisdom. No, we want to walk with the living God. We either walk with the living God in the here or now, or we are nothing in this life. And it seemed like Jesus was kind of of the same opinion as he coached his followers right at the end here. The world needs to know more than anything else that we Christians walk with the living God in the here and now. The world doesn't need to know that we're Bible experts. The world doesn't need to know that we understand our faith. The world needs to know that, no, we have the presence of God, that we walk with the living God in the here and now. And if the world suspects that about us, we'll have no problem changing the world. And I think Jesus knew this, which is why he focused on it here at the end of these very influential 40 days. The presence of the Spirit with us reminds us of Christ's teaching. The Spirit gives us words in that hour to say to those who would criticize or persecute us, as Jesus promised his apostles. And the Spirit gives us supernatural power to be witnesses, to do miracles, to heal people, to cast out demons. Um, to do whatever it is that we need to do to display the grace of God to the world. And Jesus was very passionate about that, obviously. The Spirit is God in the here and now, and you should definitely want to plunge into that Spirit. You know, Jesus said it was absolutely vital if you want to live a life of meaning and purpose in the world. Whether you're a believer or whether you're an unbeliever here today, this is a great day for you to plunge into the presence and power of God in the here and now. It's a great way to seek, no matter where you are on your journey. I do some teaching around here. Not very well, obviously, but I do some teaching. I do some coaching. I do some pastoring. Um, I do, uh, you know some strategic leadership and administration and stuff like that. I do some counseling uh, sometimes. Um, but one of my very primary jobs has to be to, to, to be a miracle worker, to be a supernatural person, however I express that. Um, and if I fail to be that, then I have failed you. And if I fail to be that, I think I have failed kind of, well, I don't know, the Holy Spirit. Can I say that? Is that theologically correct? I have failed to fulfill this mission. I have failed to pass on 
this life-changing experience um, that Jesus has commanded us to get involved with and, and, to, and to pass on. I have noticed in my life that all, when I have succeeded at being that person of power, well, I've changed entire groups of young adults in, in an evening, and they've gone on to plant churches and stuff like that. It's a very fruitful experience when I succeed at passing it on. And I just want to recruit you in that because it's not always easy uh, for me to be a, a person of, of power. It's actually much, much easier to be a teacher. Um, much easier to just show up places and share a little fancy knowledge. Uh, to show up places and do miracles is a higher bar, you know, if your standard for success is to do the impossible, it's a little more stress than to lead a great Bible study. I'm just, can I get an amen from those of you who know what I'm talking about? Uh, I need your help in that. I'll just say parenthetically um, because I have the mic. So, like, if you would come Sunday morning with this sort of eagerness, with an attitude, with an expectancy, with sort of a rush for the presence of God, that would be awesome for me. That would be so awesome, you know. Uh, there, there are some people sometimes, I think, I mean, not you, but, you know, that person next to you, uh, judge them, who, who maybe, like, come to church, they kind of drag in, uh, maybe they're, I don't know, they, they might even be late. None of you, none of you. But occasionally a blue water, occasionally someone, usually the family with really small kids who are sick, will come late. Um, and it doesn't like fill the environment uh, with a lot of eagerness and expectation and sort of a rush for the Lord's presence. Instead, sometimes it feels like the worship team is like, we're trying really hard to kind of get you all the pull for the presence of God, but, uh, you know, there's five people here. And they don't look pleased, to be honest. You know? Uh, so we can make that adjustment. And the reason I'm saying stuff like that is not to guilt anyone. Well, there's one person I'm trying to guilt, but I won't name names. <laughs> Just to keep you edgy. Um, but because, uh, I mean, it's evidently a big deal to make sure that we're passing on supernatural experience in the presence of God in supernaturally powerful ways. That's evidently like, I mean, it's the, dude, it was the last thing he said before taking off. And if we're fumbling that away for whatever reason, uh, then, then, you know, that, that sucks. And I can tell you that it's the easiest thing in the world to fumble away, which is why we have to do it as one of our distinctives. It's the easiest thing in the world to avoid, you know. A lot of days I feel like, well, what I really want to do is just, I will wow them with my wit and teaching ability. I'll do a little song and dance up here, and I'll tell you that's a lot easier than getting a prophetic word. It's a lot easier uh, than healing somebody. So I need help. And uh, if you'd like to be supernatural people and participate and pass on this experience that has been passed down to us across these two millennia, then that would just be awesome. Be awesome. Uh, enough said. If you're with me, just you know, high five the people to your left and your right. And I have so many stories, man. I have so many stories when it works. Um, you know, uh, and, and some of them have just been so shapeful, so important to me. Uh, when I go to my short lists, a lot of times they're the same stories. I remember very crisply something that happened probably 20 years ago now. Um, this, uh, this, uh, this young woman who was just, just like, just investigating Jesus. I mean, starting to believe in Jesus, sort of. But she had um, a liver disease. Her liver could not, well, it wasn't, di it wasn't producing what it needed to digest certain nutrients. And uh, it was getting worse. It was getting worse. Evidently, it was um, a progressive sort of disease. Uh, and so barely knew anything about Jesus, but called me over uh, to, uh, to pray for her uh, one evening uh, with a couple friends. I remember praying for her just to experience the presence of God, praying for her to feel her liver 
to, to heal her liver, and uh, the presence of God just came upon me so strongly in a way that to this day is, is just one of my most unique experiences. And when the Spirit came upon me, the way, the way it felt was it felt like God's jealousy manifests, like how dare anything try to damage this young woman. That's kind of how I felt, just the heart of God for her. And I said with absolute authority and absolute certainty, I, I, I rarely have that, but I just had it in that moment. And I said, you will be healed in the name of Jesus, spirit of infirmity. You leave her alone. And she didn't know anything about anything, just like barely investigating Jesus, just starting to believe. She opened her eyes and she said, it's gone. I just know it. She was healed instantly. And today is an awesome minister of the Lord. As a, a friend I knew uh, after college, it ended up being a very close friend who was locked in this uh, sex-addictive, hyper-promiscuous uh, lifestyle. Um, and uh, a, a lot of it was, uh, was, uh, was gay. He was sort of, uh, this was in the Bay Area, he was sort of locked into that lifestyle, that culture uh, that the area was uh, quite famous for, particularly back in the 80s. And the Lord spoke to him. Again, he was just kind of coming back to the Lord. The Lord spoke to him and said, you know, go hang out uh, with, with Jordan and, and you'll receive healing. I didn't, I didn't, I had no idea how to approach um, uh, some of what he was going through. Uh, but we were at a meeting uh, one day like this and he said, Jordan, you're supposed to pray for me. I prayed for him and he was knocked unconscious for two hours. And, and my ministry time was just standing there making sure he was okay. <laughs> I was just like, you all right? <laughs> Um, when he woke up, he was free. Uh, just never went back to the lifestyle. I, 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 I don't even know how that works. I don't even know how that sort of deep soul, spiritual healing works. But the presence of the Lord came upon him and just did some business, knocked him out, did some business. He got up, you know, just became a powerful minister in, in sexual healing and, and freedom and deliverance and today is married with a few kids, just has a gorgeous family, and doing it. I don't even know how that works, but I know it doesn't without the presence of God, without the presence of the Spirit in, in the here and now. Um, one of the Holy Spirit retreats that we did once we sort of became a church, I was, uh, uh, we were at a prayer line, and I was just sort of praying for uh, people as they came up just to experience the presence of the Lord. And there was one brave young woman there who came to a Holy Spirit retreat to experience the presence of God and didn't even believe yet. She was still not a believer, would have called herself an atheist uh, before coming, but just had experienced something of love and goodness in the fellowship and was hanging out, and she showed up. God love her, you know, just the courage to try something. And she just showed up, and I mean, her look at me, and, and she said, all right, you can pray. Um, so I laid a hand on her, prayed for her. Of course, you've anticipated the story. The Holy Spirit came upon her, just knocked her flat, knocked her out. She wrote an account of this afterward for me, um, uh, published it online, as I recall. Uh, she said, yeah, you know, this guy prayed for me. I was knocked unconscious, and when I got back up, I believed. Well, you would, wouldn't you? You would. She just needed to meet the Lord in that way. There are lots of different ways to come to faith. That's a good one. That's a good one. So many stories, but I'll tell you what my most important story is. My most important story of the presence and power of God is the next one. It's the one that's going to happen today. Right? Right? And then it will be the one after that. Because this is something that we have to pass on. Or we've done the kingdom uh, a great uh, disservice. Um, so pursue this. Uh, we have a Holy Spirit retreat coming up. When? The 28th and 29th of June. You want to sign up for that. But don't wait. There's going to be a prayer line over there in a few seconds. What you want to do is get up and go get you some presence and power of, of the Holy Spirit. You want to go to your Ohana group. Every Ohana group, every small group meeting that we have is Blue Water Mission. There's this thing called a mush pot. 
At some point in the evening, probably, or the day, if you have a day group, you're going to get in a circle, you're going to invite someone to get in the middle, and everybody's going to pray for you. And they're going to pray about this, they're going to pray about that, they're going to listen to the voice of God for you, but the main thing they're going to be after is that you experience God in that little circle of ragged people. Uh, and that's what we've been doing for 2,000 years. And you need to get in on that. So turn somebody and say, yeah, you need to get in on that, man. That's just a primer. Uh, let's pray, shall we? So uh, let's say uh, if you've come today and you would like to experience the presence and power of God uh, with some healing in your body. You've come today, you're, you're, you're sick, you're injured, uh, you've been struggling with some sort of condition, it's worn you down a little bit. Um, why, don't you, why don't you just stand up where you are? Go ahead and just stand. We like to do it this way from time to time. Allergies. Somebody's like, oh, nasty allergies this past week or two. Who is that? Stand up. Make sure you get up. Thanks. Let's hear the Lord calling that out. Because the mangoes are coming in. Yeah, that always makes you, that, that's always junk. Makes your eyes burn. <clears throat> Somebody has a, th I'm not sure if it's a throat thing or a tooth thing way in the back, way in the back. Who is that? That's you? Hey, man. <clears throat> I just, what I'm doing is just sort of listening to the Lord to make sure that <laughs> he's calling somebody out. No, you need to stand up too, Natalie. Get that thing taken care of. So every once in a while, he'll just whisper to people, to me and, or somebody else on our team and say, oh, call this person out. So that's what I'm doing. Yeah, some sort of some sort of scarring in your abdomen that is lingered and causing you some pain and discomfort. I'm not sure what the scarring is from, but like lower abdomen, I guess, I mean, I think of like childbirth scarring or something, but I'm not at all sure it's that. Who is that? Go ahead and stand up if that's you, if you're not standing already. Some sort of adhesion or sticking point in your lower abdomen. All right, so let's pray for the presence and power of God just to come and, and distribute some free gifts and experiences to, so that we can pass on what we have experienced. So some of you veterans already know what to do. Just, just, just gather around the people who are standing near you. Um, if uh, you see somebody standing and, and nobody has gathered around them to pray, what you want to do is just, just walk up to them and maybe very politely lay a hand on their shoulder very lightly just to kind of make some contact because here's an insight, the power of the kingdom of God very often passes person to person. Uh, so uh, make a little contact. You know, we are one body, one family. And when we minister one to another, it is a display of love that is dear to the heart of God. Father, I just pray for the for the filling of the Holy Spirit, for the manifestation, for the coming of the Holy Spirit in the room. As Jesus taught us to pray, let your kingdom come here on earth, just like it happens in heaven. There's no sickness, there's no disease in heaven. So we pray that, uh, that you would provide us some supernatural moments. And in the name of Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, be healed in your bodies right now. Whatever the condition is, be healed in Jesus' name those conditions I called out and all of the conditions that I did not. Uh, those of you who are gathered around, ask for a one sentence description of what the medical issue is. Just one sentence, even if it's I hurt here. And then uh, those of you who are gathered around, uh, some of you veterans, just bless it to go away. In the name of Jesus, be healed there. Go ahead. We'll take uh, 45 seconds of ministry time. Go.
All right, if it's something that you can immediately check, check it out, see if it got better. And if it did, uh, give a high five to the people who blessed you. Yeah. I know some of you can't tell right away, but that's cool. Anybody already get better? I see some high fives. Anybody paying attention to me? No, no. I've lost control. Thanks. Have a seat for a minute. Uh, anybody experience some relief in the moment? Wave at me. Yeah, what happened? Oh, allergies. This, then uh, all the congestion went away. That's cool. That's a nice sign. Anyone else? Feel better right away? Can I have the uh, prayer ministry team go over along the Mackay wall now? And uh, some of them have been praying for 24 hours before showing up. So you want to get there. They're all, they're juiced. Uh, they're ready to go. And you can help them by going eagerly with attitude, with expectation that conditions the environment. Um, because faith uh, is a potent thing. Potent thing. It's not always everything. Feel free to drag your doubt with you, but just make sure that uh, you take a little faith along as well. Uh, anybody on the prophetic team have words that they'd like to share this morning before we close? Jace has one. I feel like I have a word for Sonia. Uh, you're sitting over there in the green. Did I get your name right, Sonia? Okay. Uh, I felt like the word I have for you is that uh, you have a calling in your life to be almost, uh, I was gonna say pastor, but I feel the more accurate term is a discipler. Uh, the Lord has placed a calling in your life to be a discipler specifically for the people around you and seeing them move from a place of depression to joy. I feel Amen. that has something to do with uh, a little bit of your story, your testimony, the witness that you bring, uh, but it also has to do with the joy that you bring. And I think there's a supernatural joy that the Lord has given you that brings freedom uh, to those around you. If that resonates with you, I'd love to pray for you, um, specifically uh, for the Holy Spirit to uh, supercharge that joy in this season, uh, that the Holy Spirit would open up the doors for you to disciple people around you. Um, the other part of the word, uh, to get specific, I feel that your ministry calling in this season is for here, uh, not for someplace else, but for this space, uh, here at Blue Water, but more so here in Hawaii. Uh, and if so, if that speaks to you, I'd love to hear more and pray for you more. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Sonia. You want to share one, Justin? We will close with this. Well, the picture I got was uh, somebody worshiping in a, in a rainbow, and I really felt like that was the, the promise of God, and, and more so a promise that's been spoken over your life or that you felt that God has placed in your heart that hasn't come to pass yet, and that we really need to just come to God in worship and in faith and believe that God's going to bring that promise to pa come to pass. Um, in Genesis 9:16, so when I see the rainbow in the clouds, I will remember an eternal covenant between God and every living creature. So God has placed that promise in your heart. So just, just come to Him. If, if you want prayer, feel free to come up. A promise is a promise. Everybody, stand up. Let's dismiss. Uh, Father God, I pray that you would perfect your purposes in each of us before we leave. I pray that we'd all change a little bit. I pray, Lord that we would all experience a token of your presence and love today. I pray that we would be for one another what we need to be. Uh, thank you for the privilege of carrying this forward and passing it on. Make us good at it. We pray in Jesus' name. Everybody says.